So now understand all key terms based on the retractions to Lucas and Adam and Ken. Okay, so now we have a cleaned up version of the problem. And um, since the problem now hasn't been shot down, we still have the problem articulating the intimate connection between this, this special capacity for perception and the special ability to move your body. Okay? So that's the question we have now. Okay, so the, the, the desideratum is to demonstrate that the capacity for proprioception is a condition on a sense of practical possibility in normal agents. Okay, a sense of practical possibility is my term for a sense of what you can do. Okay, sense of your, your actions, your behavioral repertoire. Okay, and the strategy is going to be that I'm going to argue that proprioception is a constraint and implicit knowledge of knowledge of uh, what you can do of your practical possibilities through looking at the connection in motor imagery. Okay, motor imagery is uh, what's called motor simulation, or uh, which was mentioned by the lady talking about motor neurons. And my claim is, oh, this is cut off. Um, okay, so. Uh, my claim is that reflection on motor imagery reveals that in normal agents, I think I have to revise this too, core ways of grasping practical possibilities are uh, already constitute a grasp of possibilities for a body that one proprioceptively senses. Okay, okay. Yeah. okay. good. Yeah? We're okay? Project. Good. Okay, so the, the general shape of the argument is a two stage argument. The first stage is about teleology, and the second stage is about the, uh, what perception has to do with constraining that teleology in, in the case of normal agents. So first, the first stage is uh, um, the argument that intentional action can be constrained by a sense of what you can do with your body, and then the second is that proprioception is required for having a sense of what you can do. Okay, how do you argue for stage one? So when you act intentionally, part of that is, I take it, knowingly taking some means toward an end. And uh, if you restrict yourselves, uh, ourselves to the teleologically basic ways we can act, then I think it's plausible that you have to have some grasp of your basic behavioral repertoire. So you can have some conception of what means you can take toward the ends that you want. Okay? Now, why? Because if you didn't have this grasp at all, it's going to be very hard to see how an agent can exploit their capacities to act in various scenarios. Okay? This is just a sort of conceptual commitment. Now, um, and actions have a kind of robustness in terms of the process that leads an action towards the goal that it's its desired completion, and there's a kind of flexibility of means and ends there. So for example, if I want to grab this cup, uh, this, this bottle, and Lucas wants to prevent me, he can send a squad of cats to, to try to, um, to, to uh, frustrate my every action, but then I might try to grab it from the top or something like that. So there are many, many different means I can use. So because there is this instrumental connection here, I think um, a very basic grasp of your behavioral repertoire in some sense is presupposed by your ability to act, okay? at least by your ability to act intentionally. Okay, because of that, then we can say that uh, a condition on intentional action is some grasp of the sense of practical possibilities. Okay? Roughly, the sense of basic actions possible for you. Okay? If, even if you don't believe in um, basic actions, because you are Thompsonian, um, you will still have a notion of the sense of practical possibilities. It's just that you won't have a notion of basic actions. Okay, and in the second stage, um, I argue that a sense of practical <coughs> possibilities is constrained by proprioception, and you can see this by looking at cases of motor imagery. Okay, and now I'm going to do the argument below. Okay, it, it's a little bit complicated, comes in a couple couple steps. It's complicated because there's no way to do it directly. If someone comes up with a way of doing it directly, fantastic, tell me please. So um, 
this is roughly how it works. First, I motivate the idea that motor imagery is a way of uh, disclosing action possibilities for you. Okay, motor imagery. I'll say what <coughs> motor imagery is in a moment and it will be, become clear. Second, I'm going to observe that motor imagery is phenomenologically distinctive in a certain kind of way, such that the grasp of action possibilities is always a grasp already for that body that you have per perception in. Okay? So there is a kind of special property which I call phenomenological concordance. Okay? And then I'm going to say why we should think of motor imagery as privilege in revealing this dependence between action possibilities and um, the body that you have per perception in. And in order to do that, I'm going to call on some signs to link motor imagery and action. There's good evidence for that. Because these cases, up to then, will, the argument will have been conducted through voluntary motor imagery. I need to generalize the case from voluntary motor imagery to what's known as implicit motor imagery processes. I have to show that implicit motor imagery processes are pervasive in everyday action. Once I can do that, then I will have shown that the sense of my action possibilities in the everyday action of normal agents is, sorry, I use McDowell's language, always already for the body I have per perception in. Okay? Yeah. Okay? Yeah. That's, that's the, the structure of the argument. Okay, what's motor imagery? So Matt already talked about it a little bit. So this is imagery of yourself performing an action. So I can, Im I can walk through this door. I can also imagine myself walking through this door. Okay. So Lucas wants to do an experiment on me and he makes me walk through many, many doors of different kind of heights and widths. And uh, often I can answer that simply by looking at the, the, uh, the door and imagining whether I can walk through it. Okay? So that's, that's a case of motor imagery. Now, but in particular there's a constraint on this. So in the way it's used in the literature, it's, it involves a first personal perspective on the action imagined. And you feel yourself performing the action along with sometimes the kind of effort and movement involved. Okay, so Elvira is a virtuoso violinist, and she is now imagining playing the Bach Chacon. The Bach Chacon involves huge effort in involving the, in imagining the climax of playing the Chacon. She also feels the difficulty, the kind of tension, both musically and um, and in terms of the motor processes involved. And that's, that's the kind of thing that's involved in internal imagery. I mean, you can imagine that also as a philosopher, when you're trying to articulate a thought, the kind of difficulty of getting the thought out finally. It's both a motor difficulty in articulating the words and also thinking and so on. Okay, so you get an idea. Contrast this case with what's called external imagery or visual imagery. You observe the performance of the action as a spectator. So Elvira, again, in some cases, um, she um, has this alternate career as a concert violinist and um, all concert violinists love the applause of the audience and Elvira is no exception and she imagines herself uh, seeing herself from the balcony being applauded at Carnegie Hall and that's the kind of external imagery one has of a performance okay now um, so you have different kinds of imagery the kind of imagery I'm talking about here is sensory, and you have different kinds of point of view in imagery, first person and third person, um, and the kind of distinction that I'm talking about is if, for example, you have a tour de Istanbul, and you, you imagine you are the, the, the leader in the race, first person imagery will involve seeing just the road in front of you, as it were. The third person imagery will involve being a spectator, seeing yourself at the front of the pack. Okay, that's the difference in the kind of imagery involved. And uh, you can contrast the phenomenology of visual versus motor imagery. 
So in visual imagery, you can have both possibilities. You can both have the first person imagery and also the third person imagery. That's not the case for motor imagery, though. You can any way of imagining acting is a way of imagining acting from the inside. I think now I'm very wary of using this term. From something like the first person point of view. Yeah. Okay. So in that sense, motor imagery is phenomenologically distinctive and in Mike Martin's words, there is no room to distinguish between the point of view imagined and the object so imagined. Okay. So one way, another way to say that is that there is no detached perspective available for you to take where you could continue to exploit motor imagery and not yet be experiencing, uh, imagining some bodily experience in the way you, exp uh, you experience proprioception typically. Okay, good. So I've motivated the first two uh, ideas. And the third idea is why we should think of motor imagery as privileged in revealing this dependence. This is partly because of the link between motor imagery and action. So we shouldn't think of motor imagery as imagery of the perception of action. Rather, we should think of it as imagery of acting. Okay? And the evidence for that can, comes from uh, partly from scientific aspects. Okay, there's, there's very powerful empirical evidence that the capacities for bodily action and motor imagery are linked. This largely comes from work from the genre group and other kind of groups involved in motor simulation. So you see um, neurally that there's widespread overlap in neural activation, namely in areas such as the supplementary and premotor areas. You see behavioral parallels, namely the kind of laws that govern both motor imagery and action, executed action, are similar. And um, you see that the time it takes to perform actions is very similar. Okay, okay I'm not going to go into the details. Just um, So um, the, new, the, the areas <coughs> involved in execution, mental simulation, action observation, and silent uh, verbalization of action verbs involves activation of the same neural areas. And this, this is a, um, a meta-analysis uh, from Grez and Dissetti from um, almost 20 years ago now. But uh, the result still holds very good. Behavioral studies. Um, so actions performed covertly and overtly seem to take roughly the same time, at least some central action. So think of reciting the alphabet. You can recite it aloud, you can sing it aloud, and you can also sing it in your head. Maybe the Istanbul, Istanbul philosophers will start complaining about singing in your head now. <laughs> so I, I'm not going to use any words with in. Um, <laughs> But um, there are many results showing that uh, imagining and performing actions take roughly the same amount of time. Some, some of them, okay, at least they are central cases. So it's also not only for re reciting things, but also walking and things like that. Now, if you look at constraints, the main constraint on motor control is what, what's called Fitts law, where you have a speed accuracy trade-off. So this is how it works. So if this, so this law is very easy to walk in and out of. Now, if it were much smaller, the aperture were much smaller, I would walk much more slowly because it would be very hard to walk through it. So you have a trade-off between speed and accuracy. And the harder it is, the longer you take, roughly. Now, um, you can find this law being uh, obeyed in most uh, motor imagery tasks. And the interesting thing is that in cases where you find violations of Fitts law with ballistic actions, like uh, for example, if you do a broad jump, it doesn't suit Fitts law because basically Fitts law is a function of continuous motor control because you can adjust. If you have a ballistic action, basically you have to plan it and do it in one go, so you can't really do the kind of adjustment so you don't get the kind of log law. Now, in those cases where the actual performance does not obey Fitts law, the imagery also fails. <coughs> I think that's very interesting. So that's a very nice connection here. Okay, finally, you see that uh, when you look at biomechanical constraints, uh, imagery is subject to the same biomechanical constraints as actual action. So what's biomechanical constraint? 
uh, moving in certain ways is easier than other ways. So for example, when you turn your hand, it's easier to turn your hand in than out. Okay? Easier to turn, try it. Yeah? Okay, imagery fulfills this as well. Okay. Okay, so what are the ramifications? Um, there's strong evidence that capacities for motor imagery and intentional action are linked. And so I, I, I'm going to move forward a bit faster <coughs> and suggest that um, this, uh, this indicates that uh, proprioception in being um, important for motor imagery, voluntary motor imagery, uh, is important for action. But because we're not always performing voluntary motor imagery before actions, sometimes we do, it's not going to be a very important claim because it's going to be only important insofar as you can establish somehow being in a position to perform voluntary motor imagery before action is somehow the reason why <coughs> perception is important for that. So that, that's not a very good claim. So um, I go a different route by trying to find motor imagery processes in the action planning process itself. So these, these things are called implicit motor imagery. So it's called implicit, not by me, but by psychologists. I know people hate the term implicit, but they just follow the psychologist's term. And it's implicit because of the following. One, when they do the tasks, they are not instructed to voluntarily perform motor imagery. Two, after debriefing, they don't report performing motor imagery. Three, the timescales of the tasks are such that it's going to be very, very hard for them to be voluntarily performing motor imagery on each trial. <coughs> But you still find processes and behavior that's indicative of motor imagery. So these cases they call implicit motor imagery. Okay. So here's the shepherd task, most famous task in cognitive science. Same figure or not? <coughs> not. What? Same. 50-50. Same, yeah. Okay. So now, notice you can ask the same kind of... So the, the, the great result about the shepherd task was uh, the time it takes to answer is basically a function of the angle of rotation. So that was what was found. And this, this started the whole idea of, of visual buffers and representations and so on and so forth, and the idea of mental chronometry. Do people need that? <laughs> okay. So... We can do the same shepherd task, but with different stimuli. So you can take hands in different orientations and so on and so forth. Now you can do that. And uh, once you do that, then you can show people something and then uh, uh, a kind of hand in some orientation. And then you can ask them whether it's left or right. Yeah? Okay. So you can imagine that doing that requires some kind of simulation of sorts. And you can compare it against actually moving your hand into that position. Okay. So. If you're shown this, then you have to move your hand to this position. And here you're shown this, and you just have to answer left or right. Okay? And the performance profiles are very, very similar across a wide range of stimuli. Okay? That's very striking. And this kind of curve here with the, the, the uh, peak in response time here is very much a function of the response difficulty, the biomechanical aspect, because this part is when you have to rotate it like this, maximally difficult. Okay? Okay, so this seems to indicate that motor imagery is tracking actual constraints on action. And it's, it's, it's mirrored in, in actual action. Now, the nice thing is that um, how, is, how, how do we show that proprioception is involved? So, um, the important thing is that they did experiments where um, the hand was placed in different kinds of postures while they were doing the same, they were shown the same kind of stimuli. And depending on the postural conflict between the positions and the position of the hand, you got a difference in the behavioral profile. So you know that proprioceptive information is actually influencing this judgment. And you don't get this in the efferent agents, okay? because you don't have proprioceptive information, so you can't have conflict. Okay, good. So, what does this show? Um, can I just clarify? So what you're saying is for the hand judgment, if my hand happened to already be like this, I'm faster. faster? Yeah, okay. that's right. There's right. a facilitation effect. Yeah, that's right. Okay, 
let's just um, wrap up the ramifications. Um, the presence of the biomechanical constraints, like this kind of difficulty, ease difficulty, reflect motor imagery and can't be traced to vision or visual imagery. Why? Because in the shepherd task, you only have a, the behavioral time is just a function of the angle of rotation. But here you have two things. You have a function of the angle of rotation plus the biomechanics. Yeah? The biomechanical difficulty can't be traced to the angle of rotation. So it's not just a visual imagery task or any kind of other imagery. It has to be some kind of action-related imagery. Okay, first thing. So uh, biomechanical constraints suggest implicit motor imagery is constrained by factors which influence actual execution implicating the sense of your action possibilities. And the postural factors, when you have this postural conflict, suggest that implicit motor imagery is constrained by proprioception and proprioceptive awareness. So if we generalize, um, uh, we see that um, what we have in the shepherd task is implicit motor imagery processes because you're not asked to actually voluntarily perform motor imagery. You're just asked to answer whether it's left or right. Okay. Um, so you have that finding in implicit motor imagery and if, uh, as we saw from the meta-analysis, implicit and voluntary motor imagery processes are not relevantly different from the science and the neuroimaging, you have the same stuff, then um, we can conclude that uh, you have these constraints in all implicit motor imagery processes. So now we move the step in the argument. We have proprioception is a condition on voluntary motor imagery. Now I show that proprioception is a condition on implicit motor imagery. Okay. So skeptic can still say implicit motor imagery, nah, not so important. So are these conditions present in everyday action? And then we have to look at other studies. Uh, most of these involve affordance studies. So uh, this is a reaching study, but I want to talk about um, this kind of study for judging a grip. Okay, this is from uh, Johnson, uh, who was formerly, who is now known as Scott Johnson Fry. Um, and um, in this study, you have to either judge the grip or grab the dowel. Okay. And basically, the, the results are, are remarkably uh, the same, whether you're actually doing the action or you judge the grip that you perform. And these kinds of actions are the kinds of things that you would do on an everyday basis. So there's, there is a kind of indication that there is the, the type of implicit motor imagery processes involved in planning everyday action. Okay. Summary. So, that's what I went through, and then if that's correct, then the sense of action possibilities in the everyday action of normal agents is already conditioned by their proprioception. Okay, so what does that show? Uh, remember originally that the desideratum was to demonstrate that capacity for proprioception is conditioned of, on the sense of practical possibility in normal agents. The strategy was to argue through motor imagery, and what we saw in motor imagery that core ways of grasping action possibilities are already a grasp of possibilities for a body that you have proprioception in. So that gives me this kind of argument that I was hoping for. And um, now, once you have this, then you have to go back and look at the efferent agents because the whole thing started off with the causal functional phenomenological contrast between afferented agency and de afferented agents. Yeah. Okay, so mm -hmm. if if my account says that uh, afferented agents have these kinds of skills because of proprioception, then it makes predictions about what de afferented agents should lack, and so on and so forth. So you look at de afferented agents, then you can ask, do they pose a challenge to the claims I want to make? Because they are grasp they have a grasp of practical possibilities but without proprioception, and I can say no because they have a different sense of the action space, the action possibilities. It's more visual and the evidence comes from them doing these motor imagery tasks. They don't have these biomechanical and postural constraints. Okay? And um, so if you look at the predictions of my account, motor imagery you find biomechanical and postural constraints. Uh, predictions are that deafferented agents have different sense of practical possibility and that chronically deafferented agents should perform motor imagery differently. 
And basically, both predictions are confirmed in recent science. Okay? What's so that chronically? Chronically. Had it for a long time. Yes, for, for a while. Because uh, acutely, the efferent, usually they can't really act, and then uh, it's very hard to measure uh, things because you don't know whether it's left over from what, what was the case before, and so on. So. Yeah, uh, they have to do motor imagery, it's like, in what sense is, like, so for example, mm -hmm. are they, like, is it more like, is it they're visualizing themselves from outside? So, so um, you mean this, the second claim? Why still keep, why still call it motor imagery, right, well, they are using something, mm -hmm. I understand, but is it, so, can you tell us more about, like, how different, so that, so, um, uh, if you look at this, so um, um, I'll just summarize. Um, so basically, when they use motor imagery, uh, if you do <laughs> neural imaging, the same areas come up. But behaviorally, the results are very different. Uh, one, they don't have the biomechanical constraints. Two, if you let them use their vision when they are simulating, then the results look much more like our results behaviorally. And that indicates that vision is somehow giving them a, a sense of actual possibility, in this case, much more than the, the kind of new drugs. So basically, they're simulating like as, so when I'm just thinking simulating, I'm simulating as I would act, so obviously mm -hmm. he's simulating as he would act. Mm -hmm. And if he actually has <coughs> vision, therefore, in this case, he's still using vision. Yes. That's the idea. Yeah, okay. that's the idea. Um, Okay, to summarize, remember in the morning, my, not in the morning, uh, at the, uh, just after lunch, my question was how does an agent need to be in touch with her body in order to act with it? I've argued that an agent needs to have the capacity for proprioception. Um, and that concludes the first third of the book. And after that point, we look at the capacities for other forms of bodily awareness, for example, ownership and balance. Thank you. Um, thank you, Hong Yu. Uh, I really enjoyed reading the paper and the chapters. I, I think it's a sign of really good philosophy that uh, it raises lots of questions, and I've very much felt that in reading your work. Um, but I'm focusing on three kind of areas. So I've, there's much more we could talk about, but I'm going to narrow things down to three, three areas. And I'm going to stray a little bit out of the territory of the chapter, <laughs> though perhaps not of the paper into some of the things in chapters one and two, but that weren't or haven't been discussed yet. Um, so the three sort of areas that I want to talk about, um, and I'm afraid I don't have any slides, so I'm just going to talk. You just have to concentrate. Um, so Hong Yu's question is, what's the role of bodily awareness in action? And particular is the view that he calls dependency true? That is, is bodily awareness a condition of action? The focus of the discussion in this part of the book is uh, the conscious experience of one's body from the inside. Now, I'm, I'm not persuaded by worries about talk from the inside, so I'm going to stick with using that terminology. Um, now, as Hong Yu emphasizes in his sort of summary or the glossary that he gave us earlier, there are information processes in proprioception that are not conscious, that may be necessary for action or action control, but the argument doesn't show, doesn't, doesn't really concern those. So showing that they our condition of action would not, as I understand it at least, show that dependency is true. Um, and one question I'd like to raise, but just in passing, and I think maybe he's answered this uh, earlier on today, um, is whether we should include kinesthetic awareness as an element of proprioception. That is, is the focus on positions, is, is the focus one, as, is the focus of the argument a focus on the position sense specifically? or awareness of the body from the inside more generally. So other kinds of awareness, that for me at least, I would include, I would not count kinesthesia as part of proprioception necessarily, but want to say these are different types of awareness of the body. So one is a, an awareness of the configuration and position of the body, the other of the movement of the body. Um, you might think that both of those things are involved in action. Hong Yu sticks to the terminology of proprioception. Does that include kinesthesia as well? 
Okay, so the questions I want to focus on concern really questions about the nature of remote control and what that involves. Um, then questions about the argument that he, he set out uh, just now. Um, and then I want to go back to the Marcel type cases and the claims about dissociation, which are required for well, it's not clear how, how they figure in the, in the overall strategy of the argument, so perhaps we, perhaps we can come back to that. So first of all, questions about remote control and what it amounts to. Now, one motivation for dependency is the thought that it underpins an explanation of what is distinctive about embodied action, of acting with, with one's own body, that is not a form of remote control. So, that, so, so what dependency gives you is not remote control, or we might just say control. What, what dependency gives you is control over your body, uh, and if you lack... Uh, awareness, you in effect have a form of, end up with a form of remote control. But what does being not a, not being a form of remote control amount to? On Hong Yu's account, control, that is not remote control, involves three features. First, actions can be basic or direct, not done with something else or by means of something else. Secondly, the body is not a target object. One acts with it and through it, it doesn't need to target it in order to act with it. And third, attention to effectors is not required. In acting, our attention is usually to our goal and not direct to our body. So, in contrast, remote control of one's body then would lack these features. So the suggestion is that if one couldn't be aware of the body from the inside, then action would be a form of remote control, i.e. it would lack those three features. So the thought is that dependency is explained by the connection between bodily awareness and these three features that ground control. So two initial questions. Is, is feeling, is bodily awareness required for these features? And are these features all that control requires? I think the questions are related. If these are not all the features that control requires, then it may be that feeling, bodily awareness, is not required for these features, but it's required for control, because it's required for the, the additional features that, are, that control requires. Now, actually, I'm not sure whether Hong Yu sees um, bodily awareness as directly required for these features. Certainly, the examples of action in deafferented patients lack these features, and they lack control. So what deafferented patients have lost is necessary for both these features and for control. But of course they lack any information, conscious or otherwise, from proprioception and kinesthesia. So we should be careful not to conclude that awareness rather than simply proprioceptive information is required for these features. Now, I'm not, I'm not accusing Hong Yu of making that mistake, although I do think sometimes he comes close to making the claim. Um, in fact, the argument from deaffrontation is used the other way around action is still possible in deaffrontation, so awareness is not necessary for action. But what about that second question, the question about whether those three features that Hong Yu outlines are sufficient for control? They're clearly necessary. I think, I think that's fairly uncontroversial. But we might think there's something missing in addition, a sense of what we might call the ownership of one's actions. So in the case of remote control, so the pilot in the ship type cases. The, the person operating machinery or whatever it might be, there's a gap between what I set out to do and the achievement of those things, those goals. Although I might press buttons and pull levers and so on, there's a gap between my doing that and what happens. For example, I'm not directly aware of what happens as being a consequence of my pressing buttons. That is, I'm not aware of the efficacy of my actions. So it's true that I might see what I recognize as my hand doing something, and in the ordinary case, I might be aware from the inside that I'm bringing something about. So, so in the case of efficacy, it might be that I, can, I have visual access to the efficacy of my action, so I can see that it's my hand that's picking up the bottle. But what I'm suggesting is there's another component to our um, control of our actions, which is that I am aware from the inside that it is me and my body carrying out my actions. So, that, so I want to suggest there's an, a notion of efficacy, of being aware of the efficacy of my actions that's a part of control. Um, but nor am I directly aware of the success or otherwise of my actions. 
in the case of, of remote control. So if I'm operating a piece of machinery, I'm not directly aware of the success of my actions. I have to wait and see what happens when I push buttons and so on. I have to observe whether I'm successful in my goals. That means there are potential illusions of control in the remote control case. I might think it's my button pushing that's responsible for what happens when in fact it's not. Or I might think it's me moving my body when it's not. Now I would suggest the same is not possible in the ordinary case. It's not possible for those sorts of illusions of acting to occur in the ordinary case. Um, though, though there may be illusions of acting, my hunch is that the explanations of such illusions will be very different from the remote control cases. So in the ordinary case, I want to suggest I'm aware from the inside, and so not only via vision, of acting and of moving and performing, and of being effective in acting, and of the success or otherwise of my actions. And I would add these conditions, which I think amount to the sense of ownership of my actions, although there's lots of debate about exactly what that means to say sense of ownership, but I'm just saying it's those two conditions, to the three conditions that Hong Yu identifies as distinctive of control. If that's right, if we should add these two extra conditions, then we can ask, does this sense of ownership of my actions depend on bodily awareness? The answer seems to me, seems to me at least, to obviously be yes. Um, so a question that I'll come back to is, does a sense of ownership depend on veridical awareness of the attributes of moving? Um, maybe not. Now, none of this would show that Hong Yu's criticisms of O'Shaughnessy are wrong, but they may give us a reason for wondering about whether his alternative defense of dependency is adequate. That's the thought. Okay, so that's the first set of sort of concerns. So Rashawnsky thinks that proprioceptive awareness is necessary for the online control of bodily action. So he thinks that feeling or bodily awareness is necessary for acting directly. And if he's right, then dependency is true. Um, Hong Yu's suggestion, as I understand it at least, is feeling a body part from the inside cannot be necessary for directly acting with it, for two reasons. Firstly, we've got the different deafferentation cases, which he sets aside, and I agree with him in doing that. And then we've got the illusion cases, the Marcel-type cases, that suggest that information that grounds action is distinct from information that grounds awareness, and perhaps shows that veridical awareness is not necessary for action, and so undermines dependency. His overall strategy is to argue that O'Shaughnessy's defense of dependency fails, but to offer an alternative defense. So, in effect, Hong Yu is arguing that the standard way of interpreting dependency is wrong, and that the alternative involves a different kind of interpretation of dependency. So, I want to look at what that alternative is now. Now, he presents really a two stage argument, I think. That, but it ends up being those, those more stages that, that he set out on the, on the slides. So the first stage is he argues that a capacity for ordinary intentional action requires a sense of what one can do with one's body. He then argues that proprioceptive awareness is required for a sense of what one can do with one's body, and so concludes that the capacity for intentional action requires a capacity for proprioception. So we've got these two stages. First, to act at all, you need to know what, what possibilities are open to you. To know what possibilities are open to you requires proprioception, proprioceptive awareness. <coughs> awareness or information? Awareness. Because it's knowledge, yeah. I think is the thought. So in acting, there are typically many ways to accomplish a goal. And this is true even for basic actions. There's always a choice as to which movement, for example, which specific way of moving to use to achieve one's goal. So I might grasp my bottle with my left hand or my right hand. That's always, those are always options that are open to me. I might reach quickly or reach slowly. So in order to accomplish some goal, one must settle on a specific way of acting, a specific way to accomplish that goal. And the thought here is that, that it would not be possible to act to achieve some goal if one did not know how to act to achieve that goal that is, if one did not know which way of acting would be appropriate to achieving it. But for the accomplishment of the vast majority of goals, there's more than one way of acting. So to achieve one's goal, one must select one of the different ways of acting available, and in order to make a selection, it must be possible to be aware of the different ways of acting that are available. And that establishes that first premise, that acting requires a sense of what possibilities are open to one. <coughs> now the second premise is that 
the capacity for proprioceptive awareness is a necessary condition for one to be aware of the different ways of acting that are available. So in settling on a particular way of acting, one must select amongst possible ways of acting. That requires a sense of what possible ways of acting are open. So capacity to act to accomplish a goal requires a grasp of what possible ways of acting are available. Some grasp of the possibilities of acting is required if one is to be able to act intentionally. Hong Yu argues that our knowledge of which ways of acting are open is grounded in our capacity for motor imagery. So motor imagery is a way of grasping practical possibilities on this view. I can engage in a covert rehearsal of an action as a way of analyzing that action. And as you can imagine performing the action as a way of, a way of finding out how or whether you can do it. And that's because, as he explained, there's a connection between capacities for bodily action and for motor imagery. The ways one can imagine acting are constrained by the ways of acting that are actually available to you. As a consequence, motor imagery provides a way of coming to know what ways of, of acting are available to you. So you can, you can, without doing anything, you can figure out what you could do to achieve some goal by imagining performing the motor actions that are required to achieve it. And you can rule out certain things as well. So motor imagery provides a grasp of practical possibilities for the body I feel from the inside. So when I imagine acting from the inside, I feel myself executing the action. And this seems to be a constitutive aspect of motor imagination. And this is what Hong Yu called the phenomenological concordance between imagery and bodily awareness. So proprioceptive awareness is therefore a condition on the voluntary exercise of motor imagery. In, these, in those cases in which I engage in voluntary motor imagery in working out how to move, proprioceptive awareness is a condition on knowledge of the ways of acting available to me. If I were not aware of acting from the inside in motor imagery, I would not know what possibilities of action are open to me. But of course there are many cases of acting that don't involve such exercises, such voluntary exercises of motor imagery. So to generalize the argument, Hong Yu argues that proprioception is also a condition on implicit motor imagery, and that implicit motor imagery is involved in everyday action. So evidence that proprioception is a condition on implicit motor imagery comes from the hand rotation experiments that he described, where the initial position of the hand constrains the task response. So current limb position constrains implicit motor imagery, therefore the capacity for proprioception is a condition on implicit motor imagery. It is what provides information about current limb position, and we'll come back to that. So implicit motor imagery is involved in intentional action. We don't typically engage in motor imagery during the course of acting. Nonetheless, Hong Yu argues, motor imagery processes subject to the very same constraints I have isolated are operative in many, day, many everyday action scenarios, even when we're not performing voluntary motor imagery. And he calls these implicit motor imagery processes. Now, Hong Yu suggests that this shows that implicit motor imagery is pervasive in action preparation processes and so part of everyday action. Since the capacity for proprioception is a condition on implicit motor imagery processes, a capacity for proprioception is a condition on everyday action. So my first question, that this is my reconstruction from the paper and from the book. And so my first question really is, have I set that argument out in the right way? And I think having now seen the on you setting out again on the slides, I think, yes, probably I've got that more or less right. Um, but my second question is, what does that argument show? And in particular, does it do enough to establish control, i.e. not remote control? Um, now, it might show that the three conditions that Hong Yu sets out initially couldn't obtain without the capacity for proprioception. But go back to my questions around those three conditions. If those three conditions are themselves not sufficient for control, we might worry that although the argument establishes that proprioception is a requirement for those three conditions, it doesn't do anything to, to show us that they're, sorry, is, a, is sufficient for those three conditions. It doesn't do anything to show that it's sufficient for control. So Hong Yu's thought is, look, we've shown here we've got a capacity for proprioception, and that's enough to rule out the case he wants to rule out of, of remote control. And my worry is, his initial characterization of remote control is such that we could satisfy that and still not have enough for the kind of control that I think 
we want to defend, where that involves perhaps a sense of ownership of one's actions. So I worry that a capacity for proprioception of the kind that he said is sufficient for meeting his three conditions is not sufficient for meeting the extra conditions that I've suggested make up an element of control, namely ownership of one's actions. So, if I've understood it correctly, the idea is that in selecting a course of action, I must be aware of the current position of my body. Um, but then two questions. Why, firstly, why is proprioceptive awareness required for that as opposed to merely proprioceptive information? That is, why isn't information about limb position that feeds into this preparation implicit too? And in fact, you can think that maybe in these tasks that, that Hong Yu has described, Awareness of the position of the body is not what constrains my motor imagery. It's where all that can come to me in visualizing are these options. And those, it turns out that what can come to me is constrained by my bodily position, but not through my being aware of that bodily position, that feeding in some way. Um, and secondly, is being aware of currently my current bodily position sufficient for control? So my thought here has two parts. The first is that Hong Yu's defense of dependency in terms of the capacity for proprioception seems only to provide a role for bodily awareness in the preparation of action, not, the, not any role for it in the carrying out of the action, whatever role that might be, but I, my feeling is there's some role there. The second is that an expression is really an expression of skepticism about the sufficiency of that. It might be that O'Shaughnessy is wrong in the way he characterizes the role of awareness in an action as it unfolds, but right to think that awareness is necessary in, in some way, in the ongoing control of action. So at least as Hong Yu characterized O'Shaughnessy's view, he's concerned awareness of the body and position of the body and the movement of the body as we act. And you might think that's wrong, but you might think nonetheless, some awareness of ongoing action is a component of our control of our actions. And I think that's missing from the capacity account that Hong Yu has given us because the capacity account is giving us preparation. Even if we grant awareness is required for that, it's giving us motor preparation or action preparation and not anything in the unfolding of the action. Okay, so let me quickly, if I may, are we doing okay? So yeah. I, could, I could stop there, but, I, but I, I thought I might talk about the Marcel cases and, and just question what we can really learn from them. This is the Marcel case. So I think this is a quote from Hong Yu, but I haven't referenced this properly. I think it is. So I think Hong Yu says the following. What the experiments show is that proprioceptive information does not have to be provided by proprioceptive awareness, and that proprioceptive representations for proprioceptive awareness can be distinct from those that are used in the control of bodily action. So we can now see why necessity and online control are false. Proprioceptive information used for the online control of action does not need to come from the proprioceptive representations underlying conscious proprioceptive awareness. So in the Marcel experiments, participants are able to reach successfully to a target despite being wrong about where their arm is. So they, they, they have an illusion about the position of their arm and yet they can still successfully reach to a target. And wrong about the direction they move their arm in reaching the target. So they have vibrotactile stimulation of the arm and that produces an illusion with respect to its position. And this illusion does not impact on reaching. The illusion does affect, nonetheless, how participants describe their movement. They make rather surprising and gross errors in characterizing the way they moved in reaching the target. They say, for example, they moved their arm left to right when in fact they moved it right to left. Cameras and others have performed similar experiments with similar results, and they have also carried out the version which uses the rubber hand illusion, again with similar results. So what should we conclude from these, I think admittedly surprising results? What the experiments seem to show is that when participants are asked to report on the position or movement of their arm, they are unable to do so correctly. But they can use information about their arm position in successfully reaching to a target. So it seems they have veridical information about their arm position for reaching, but non-veridical information about their arm position for reporting. So in these experiments, there appears to be a dissociation between bodily awareness and the bodily information involved in the generation and control of action. 
That suggests the information available to guide action is distinct from that which grounds awareness of the body. I think that's Hong Yu's line of thought, and it's what Kammers and et al. conclude. So they say, the results suggest that the matching response was based on a perceptual representation of arm position, while reaching involved a sensory motor processing of the arm configuration. So the idea here is that something like a two systems architecture in the case of bodily awareness and action that's analogous to the two visual systems hypothesis that distinguishes the processes that ground visual awareness from those that ground visually guided action. And there's, there's a sort of movement, is it a movement? There's a tendency um, in neuroscience and neuropsychology to generalize from the two visual systems approach to everything else. And it's one that I find disappointing, let me say. <laughs> I, I'm skeptical of the two visual systems approach in vision, but I think it really doesn't apply straightforwardly in the case of audition in the way that people have suggested, and I'm a little bit skeptical in this case too. Um, so, how can, we, how, can I, how can I persuade you that you should be skeptical too? Now, there's an assumption in these cases, in the Marcel and the Camus case, that the two tasks must draw on information about the same properties of the body. That is, in carrying out the reaching task, we must draw on information about the same properties of the body we must draw on in the reporting task, namely information about the initial position and direction of movement of the arm. So the thought is that you're tapping into the same thing when you ask somebody to reach somewhere and when you ask them to report where their arm is or where they move their arm. And the thought is, because it's the same information you're tapping into, the fact that you're getting different answers sug suggests that we've got two sets of information. Now, I think that's not an unreasonable assumption. To move your hand to the position of the target in the Marcel experiment, you have to move your arm from its current position to a new position in line with the target. And that requires moving a certain distance and direction. Which direction and how far depends on the current location of your arm and the location of the target. So you might think successfully reaching to the target requires to correctly specify the direction and distance of the movement given your current arm position. And that requires correct information about your current arm position. So success at the reaching task suggests that you're able to draw on veridical information about the initial position of your arm and to program the correct direction and distance of movement given that. But the failure at the reporting task suggests that information that grounds your awareness of your current arm position and the direction of your arm's movement is non-veridical. So we have a dissociation. But look, there's, there's a picture there. There's a model, and a model of what's involved in reaching to a target that's implicit in the idea there's a dissociation here. So that story about how we reach to a target presupposes a particular model or explanation of this kind of reaching. And we can imagine different models that would undermine that conclusion. So in the model um, that I described, the motor system programs a movement by specifying a distance and direction to move from a starting point in order to reach a target. But suppose the target or endpoint can be specified directly. And that, having come up with my example, I realize it has a long history. Um, because it's the kind of view that Hong Yu had reasons for rejecting at the beginning. Um, but let me just set out my way of saying here's an alternative, and then say why I think perhaps even if we re reject it, we, it still raises an issue about the conclusion. So suppose, I want you to imagine this, suppose we can move the position of a swing arm, I imagine it kind of like a crane or something like that, some, something that swings backwards and forwards, by pulling on ropes attached to either side of the arm. Pulling on the left-hand rope moves the arm to the left, pulling on the right moves to the right. Suppose we want to move the swing arm, so we've got this thing, we pull on ropes either side and it pulls it this way or this way. Now suppose we want to move it to a particular position, right? One way we can, we can do it is to note how far the end of it currently is from where we want it to be and adjust the ropes by the amount we would need to to move it through that trajectory. That's one way of shifting it. Um, but there's another way of doing it, which is just to know what the relationship is between all the possible points the arm can occupy 
and positions on the ropes to lengths. If you know that relationship, it doesn't matter where it currently is, you can simply adjust the positions of the ropes to get it where you want to go. So we've got two models that explain how you can do a perform a reaching task with this arm, one that involves directly moving it and which doesn't involve knowledge of its current position, and one which does. So which of those is correct in the case of our, our, um, our own biological movements, assuming that some similar kind of distinction can be made in the case of moving your arm, which of those is correct will depend, will um, either support or not support the claim there's a dissociation here. But, but that's about, you might say, that's about the information processing. So it's a, that's an argument about whether the information processing is of one kind or another kind. But we can make the same point, it seems to me, by simply asking the question, what's the content of our intentions in action? And how should we individuate the intentional movements we perform in carrying out this kind of reaching task? So in reaching to the target, do we intentionally move in a certain way and direction, or do we simply intentionally reach to a target and allow the detailed mechanics of the movement to be taken care of by subpersonal systems? It seems to me there needn't be either a single answer to that question. It may depend on the context. Um, and it may depend on task. So it strikes me as plausible that which features of an action are intentionally specified in acting may vary from case to case. Intentionally, I may simply reach the target, or I may reach quickly to the target, or I may reach the target with my left hand. And the detailed mechanics required to carry out each of these different movements will be taken care of subpersonally in each case. Now, if that's right, if those are my intentions in action, my awareness of the movement might vary accordingly. So if prior to moving, I'm not aware of how I will move in order to reach the target, my intention is simply to reach the target, then my awareness of how I moved may have to be recovered retrospectively. But if prior to moving my intention is to move in a particular way to reach the target, then my awareness of how I moved may be grounded in my intention to act. Now in Marcel's experiments, participants seem not to be aware of how they in fact moved. That doesn't necessarily imply that we don't ordinarily know. In the experiments, the participants' sources of information have become disrupted or are in conflict. So what they may report may simply tell us something about how that conflict is resolved. And it's worth noting too, I think, that Marcel reports that participants drew their movement incorrectly 60 to 70% of the time, but the rest of the time they got it right. And when informed of their mistake, half of the subjects showed improvement on subsequent tri trials. So it's not that this information really is not available to them, at least for some of them, they can get access to it. So it suggests a slightly more complicated picture than the idea that somehow their awareness and the information that grounds their actions are simply dissociated and are two different systems. There's a more complicated story here and what I suspect is there are specifics about this particular task that in certain circumstances show that people can perform the task without being aware of the position of their arm prior to performing the task. But I think it would be a mistake to conclude from that that we have a general dissociation between representations for action and representations for awareness in the case of bodily acting. So, do the Marcel cases show that no form of bodily awareness is necessary? Well, Hong Yu doesn't claim that. And of course, he, he himself defends a version of dependency. But does his defense, um, but his defense does not secure bodily awareness of, of acting, it seems to me, of, of performing an action. Um, so I think one way to understand um, O'Shaughnessy is as claiming that an ongoing fine-grained awareness of all the details of a movement are available to awareness, and that our awareness of these details plays a role in explaining the control of actions. I think what Marcel's case has put pressure on is precisely that view, that we are aware of all the details of our actions. Um, but so, but I, um, I suspect there's a range of other kinds of evidence that puts pressure on that idea that we're, that we're aware of all the details of our actions too. Um, but what, I, what I'm suspicious of is that Marcel's experiments show that O'Shaughnessy is wrong to think that some kind of a current ongoing awareness is necessary. And, th and that's where I think Marcel's arguments 
don't succeed. They would do if they showed a general, a general dissociation between action and awareness, but I'm skeptical that they succeed in showing that. Okay, so I'll stop there. Very nice. I don't want to disappoint you, so I don't want you to think that I'm simply generalizing the dual systems model. And in fact, I, 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 I have myself become increasingly skeptical about the prospects of the model. So if you look at people recently doing the psychophysics much more carefully, where it's much more balanced, it's much harder to get the dissociations. But I still, still think you get a range of dissociations. But it's very much task dependent. Yeah. So then you have to go back to look at um, lesion studies, and uh, it's it's much harder to find dissociations in the normal cases if you're doing the psychophysics in a very balanced way. So if you look at work from Folk of France and people like that, recently there was a multi lab uh, study in Wuhan which was validated in, in multiple labs. and. Um, they basically don't find dissociations across the, the standard tasks that uh, they were running with DF and uh, standard cases. Um, but it doesn't follow that uh, um, uh, from that. So what doesn't follow from... Uh, so what they show is that uh, the dual visual systems hypothesis in its original formulations and subsequent weakenings is is uh, is wrong, I think. So because um, it's very much interpreted as two modular systems, and in fact, now. Um, so who's this research boy? Uh, Folke Franz uh, and a bunch of other people. So Folke Franz, it's one of my colleagues at Tübingen. Uh, Franz. And, um, and there's another guy at um, Munich whose, whose name I can't remember. So there's a bunch of them, uh, they, they switch between first authors and last authors. Uh, but if you search uh, all the papers at Volker France, uh, he's in the computer science department at UB. Um, There's In early studies, uh, by, there was the senior author was this guy called Gegenfurt. And what they did was they, they, they redid the Agnoti experiments trying to put calipers in between measuring people, and they, they didn't find a dissociation, basically. So, I mean, I think, you know, one thing that's very interesting about the Marcel case is that it's, a, it's a, a relatively simple case, mm -hmm. and the task is of reaching to a target. Yeah. You're, you know, you're interested in some of these cases that involve um, quite complicated hand movements. Mm -hmm. Could we, Do you think we could get a similar dissociation there, where people were unaware of the way they moved in moving their hands? Um, so not just that they, not just they have to be aware of where their arm position is at the beginning, aware of how they... I want to say, it's not clear to me that we should generalize from the Marcel case to conclude yeah. that we could get similar dissociation in those yeah. type cases okay, too. Okay, good. So, there are cases and cases and we have to look at the details. Um, the cleanest case are some early cases that... Um, there's, there's this guy who's a dynamicist now somewhere in Florida. He, he used to do um, psychophysical experiments. Um, Kelso. Yes, Kelso. And uh, he did a bunch of experiments where he did uh, um, he restricted the blood pressure so that you couldn't feel your 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 limbs from the inside, and they were still able to do very good finger movements and different kinds of cases. So under but that's still very restricted in a way. So under restricted scenarios, you can completely act without um, proprioceptive information. Now that, that still leaves questions about proprioceptive information versus awareness versus stuff like that. So um, I have to concede that unless you buy much of the story, um, mm, this hasn't been con conclusively demonstrated and there are ways to talk at it. Now um, I do think if you think the neuropsychological evidence is strong, then there is a way of m interpreting the neuropsychological evidence that goes in my favor. But there's ways of taking it more weakly that, that show that there are dissociations, but it's not clear entirely what you can draw from it. And you don't know how, how much the patients are aware of things and so on and so forth. So that's, that's closer to your line. Yeah. Mm, so I'm happy to go with that line too. So it would just mean that my story won't be so clean. Yeah, because I think it's not... It's not, as it were, 
you want to reject the strong O'Shaughnessy view, mm -hmm. it seems to me. Yeah. But I think you could then go for a weaker view that allowed a bit more even than you mm -hmm. got in the dependent in the in the capacity dependence view that you Yes, that's right. Because once you've ruled out that strong O'Shaughnessy yeah. view, you can allow for there's much more space. to be in there. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of space. Yeah. I mean, basically, depending on the task, there's a range of content that could be involved. Demonstrative, yeah. it could just be presence, it could be all kinds of things. So, I mean, basically, once you bring in this idea of ownership, a sense of ownership that's involving, uh, as involved in the action, that a lot of things could, could be involved. I mean, presence, for example, just bodily presence could be important for those cases. So, let's talk about these cases. Um, so, the. It's not agency, but you wanted to say not no, ownership, no. but agency. No, no, no. Uh, ownership, ownership of action. Ownership of action, yeah. Yeah, but I told the agency, no. Efficacy. I, saw, I talked about efficacy yeah. and success as the two things that I... I but, you know, there were many different yeah. views about what a sense of ownership of action amounts to, what sense of it, you know, I, and I don't, you know, I don't want to get into any of that. It's just suggesting that there can be more than the three conditions that Hong Yu set out, I suppose. So, I think the rope model gets into tr trouble for, yeah. for the reasons that I put yeah. before. And, uh, and the, the other model that you had um, is not quite the equilibrium point model. You, you actually have a lookup table. So if you have a lookup table, you're going, going to expect it to be very brittle in terms of its behavior, not so flexible. Yeah, but, but again, it comes back to the thought that the Marcel task is a very particular kind yes. of task. Yeah. So it could be that we only find this dissociation, I mean, maybe it's not true because you've said there's more evidence, mm -hmm. but at least as you've, as you've presented the evidence, my thought was, maybe it's just very specific to this mm -hmm. task where it does look like there's an alternative model that we could give for moving your arm from here to here. Um, I mean, basically, what... what it wouldn't work anywhere else, but then we may not get the dissociations mm -hmm. anywhere else either. One model would be a kind of unitary model where you basically have all this information where the task extracts just different things, so it doesn't show necessarily that you have dissociated representations even. It definitely doesn't show that you have dissociated systems, but you just have different, it's just task dependent. And then um, the question is how that stuff links to the neuropsychological double dissociations. And that's, that's a question of further theory, I think. Um, I think you cannot be a complete Unitarian on, on those things. So even someone who, who wants to have a very classical story has to be able to say something about how things can come apart in some way. Yeah. Yeah. And so far I don't think anyone has given such an account. So maybe Matt will in the near future. <laughs> um, okay, that's the first... Uh, that working backwards. Um, <coughs> yes. Uh, Good. Um, the thing about the capacity of proprioception and versus um, you should stop me when uh, I'm going on to you. Um, versus um, versus proprioceptive awareness versus information. So you're right that in most cases this can be solved by information. So I, I have to provide an account for where awareness comes in. Yeah. So uh, two things. Uh, this is not in the text. Uh, so I think <coughs> we're going to pose the problem for us. There are two things that we have to talk about in terms of uh, acting with one's body not being like remote control. First of all, there's the contrast with the and patient. The second contrast, it's it's not like a form of super blind perception. That's the other contrast. So perception is playing some kind of role in consciousness. It's not that you have no role whatsoever. Yeah. And then the pressure is to articulate what, what that role kind of is. Now there are a couple things to observe here. First is that um, the role of bodily awareness in action is very different from the role of visual awareness or auditory awareness or tactile awareness in action. So it's not giving you the... So in when you're acting with your body rather than on your body, you're not using bodily awareness in order to, to have the, the, the sort of external target object of action. So in that sense, it's giving you awareness so that you can act through your body. Now then the question is, so because the standard response of why consciousness is required in the external case is, is something like this, that uh, you need consciousness in order to have a demonstrative or you need consciousness for 
to latch onto the object somehow. This is the story that you get from people like Campbell, or Clark, and almost everyone else. Um, you can't give that story here unless you think that this is first required in order to do anything else. So at least I don't want to give that kind of story. So what's the kind of story that I would want to give? Ultimately, I want to say that <clears throat> you need to be able to sort of make sense of your action in some way and without consciousness coming in somehow sometimes, that's what the capacity for perception is doing, you're not going to be able to do that. You're, you're going to be like a pilot in a ship, you're going to be alienated yeah. from your body. Which brings me to your ownership point. Yeah. I think that, that connects yeah, yeah, I think that's right, yeah. So, what were the two conditions on ownership of action? So, efficacy Efficiency. and success. How are they different? Um, but it's me bringing it about, uh -huh. and um, that my body has done what I wanted it to do. Ah, okay. Or what I intended it to do in some sense. So that, you know, if I, if I reach and my, I hit my face instead, uh, I'm aware from the inside that things have gone gone wrong. Or if I reach and you bash my arm out of the way, I'm aware from the inside that something has gone wrong. So, um, I mean, the shallow response, I could be very ecumen ecumenical, just add this on and then mm -hmm. provide an extra argument showing that uh, in the core cases for, for the basic behavioral repertoire, uh, the capacity for proprioception is a condition of these things, which is quite plausible. Because yeah. you knock out proprioception, a lot of the, these things go very quickly. So you can contrast the way IW knows the success of his actions and IW has, uh, knows that he has acted versus the way we know that we've acted. Yeah. So the interesting thing is, uh, so for example, if you look at IW, there's, there's lots of experiments uh, where, so he knows that he has acted without necessarily knowing what he has done except in very simple ballistic cases. Um, so success will be easier to show that the IW doesn't know that because he, he basically needs some feedback and he doesn't have it. Yeah. So that's the ecumenical response. Uh, the non-ecumenical one is to ask whether this really has to be a part of control and then, then we could debate about uh, whether there are instances of control that don't involve this but then your response will be, but ordinary bodily action doesn't Does evolve that, so, yeah. 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 So I'm happy to take that on board. Can, you, um, can I just point or ask about this, if you're being ecumenical about yeah, it? Okay, I'm yeah. being very ecumenical. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so thanks. Don't you get the awareness then, back in at the very beginning? It seems that at least success seems to be a concept that has to do with awareness, otherwise. Um, it's about intentional action, right? So, I don't think in every case, I, I think my capacity move is going to deal with that because lots of cases, when it's happening very fast, I think uh, proprioception just delivers, it's, it's straight from proprioceptive information to knowledge. You, you don't need to go through the loop via awareness, I think. That's so, I think it's not, so I would say it's not a Shaughnessy style awareness, so you don't necessarily need to be aware of all the details of the action, or even, uh, uh, sort of, I said it but then didn't come back to it, do you even need to be aware that you acted that you're, you need to be veridically aware of the details. So in, in the Marcel cases, I think you've got efficacy and success, yeah. and yet the people are wrong about which direction they're <laughs> moved in. But they're still aware at some level. It's but they're, so they're still aware at some level. And, it's a thin, and that's something that uh, you didn't want to, or did you want to say before. Um, right. Well, I don't want to say that you are or currently aware. I want, because right, well, okay. one, of, one of these questions is whether <laughs> perception is always occurring all the time. Yeah. I think it's partly a phenomenological <laughs> issue. Uh, Chair, yeah. you, you better take that because there are lots of This is part of the distinguishing perception and apperception mm -hmm. making important. Yes, yeah, definitely. I think when you just have failure rather than success, <laughs> you just say that this failure might yeah. be something you're, you become aware of consciously and, and you have efficacy and the capacity to recognize failure and for the general case, we don't we don't have a positive phenomenology of success. We, the positive phenomenology might be a failure. Yeah. Like that would. Yeah. Okay, but yeah. That, that would then knock out the success condition. So the failure condition will only kick in very rarely. Well, it would be lack of failure. So, so yeah, lack most of, of the time, we're not aware of failure in our mm -hmm. actions. But yeah. having the capacity to recognise failure in some sense gives us a grasp of success. Okay, that's without, good. Without uh, so that, that, that would be a slightly leaner way of doing that. That would time. that would be avoiding. I guess they're very the awareness. Like isn't, there, isn't there a fifth view that, that it's failure that yes. becomes salient? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's impossible, isn't it? 
Why don't you go to questions? Yeah. We're running a bit out of time. Yeah, let's, let's so, in, just, if there are questions, just stay sharing. Is there any? Just go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I want to ask how important it is for uh, talk about the mental imagery. And sorry, what was the other one? Implicit mental imagery or implicit motor imagery? Implicit motor imagery. Okay. And so I wanted to ask is two things. One is how is important is it? So it's wonderful uh, how you make use of lots of different sources of information for your perspective. Obviously, you're well versed in all these different research programs, and you're drawing on them in different ways. Um, but what I wanted to ask is how important is it for your perspective that these two things map the way they did, um, just at an empirical level? Uh, and if it turned out that they don't map that way developmentally, mm -hmm. is that a problem? And I'm thinking it's probably quite likely that they don't. And there may be a dependence where you can't actually do the imagery until you can do some, so you can do the actions. Yeah, you have to learn first. Yeah, yeah, that would just be, that'd be a, my guess for it. Because I, I, I'm, I'd be pretty confident they won't. Yeah. That you won't see that mapping developmentally. Yeah. Uh, then the second thing, which maybe is a little bit more substantive, is so empirically, how problematic is that, or is it? And then the more maybe substantive one is, uh, it's, at least from my perspective, it seems a little bit like there's a conflation between mental imagery as a... Now, I don't really know what you guys mean when you say consciousness or awareness most of the time. You may not know what I mean for the vocabulary I'm going to use. I'll try to clarify. It seems like there's a, 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 a conflation between action possibility as affordance, for example, and mental imagery. Um, and the mental imagery stuff is, a, in some sense, reflective, consciously reflective process. I'm not sure what you want to call it. But it, it involves something, uh, it seems to be very different from the motor imagery involved in affordances. Um, and I would also, uh, I think you could, it would be hard to argue against this, suggest that the mental imagery involved in, say, the rotation stuff, or even imagining your body, isn't going to be possible before about age four. Um, there's lots of research on counterfactual thinking, on time, thinking about into the future, planning, regulation. There's all sorts of things that seem to be related to mental imagery. I don't know if they've done the particular experiments. It's a little bit hard, I guess, instruction-wise. Um, but that can seem that they're not capable of doing those things before age four. But presumably, one, two, three, four-year-olds all have motor imagery in the sense of uh, something that like affordances. Mm -hmm. And so if that's the case, then again, I, I, I don't know what that means, if anything. But if what I've said is the case, is that problematic and, and, and how? Um, because when you talk about mental imagery in the first sense, it seems very different to me than what I think of as someone who studies What's younger kids and thinking about imagery in terms of, I wouldn't call it imagery actually, in terms of affordances. What's their capacity, what, the, what their imaginative capacities full stop? So can they, can they engage in exercises of imagination uh, they can definitely engage in pretend play. Yeah. Uh, prior to that, pretend play starts at about age two. Um, they can definitely engage in um, uh, imaginary activities of sorts. So make believe. But maybe. make believe, but, yes. Yeah. But there seems to be a, 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 something different has happened around age four with respect to mental time travel, with respect to certain types of counterfactual thinking, with respect to taking others' perspective, yeah. theory of mind stuff. Yeah. Um, what do you need mental time trouble for mental imagery? Uh, yeah, the yeah. Part is it mental? It's just imagination, it's a reflection of the... So I want to say there is some sort of imagination capability, so but not... Both factuals I understand, but mental time trouble I don't understand why they would need. No, it's just an ability that, so I guess Sutton Dorf studies as apes and says the apes can't do it, humans can, and it also seems like the three-year-olds can't do it and the four-year-olds can. I'm just trying to say there's a bunch of related abilities that seem to not be present at age four, mm -hmm. and so you're going to get uh, a separation between the two, and I'm just wondering what that does for... Great, great, great question. Um, any developmental questions, I refer to my friend, Andy Brenner. <laughs> but no, no, that's just tongue in cheek. Um, I think the developmental issues are really hard. And uh, I, I want to make constitutive claims, not about the mechanisms, but about the connection between the capacities. So because of that, I've mainly looked at the doubt case. Um, so if I would want to give a full account of the mechanism, then I definitely should look at the developmental case and the evolutionary cases as well. Um, so how important is it if it 
didn't line up. If they don't track, yeah. and if you can even have no mental imagery capabilities of the sorts that you talked about, but still presumably three-year-olds are doing yeah. lots of intentional awareness in some yeah. sense, that's why I also don't play. Uh, so are we sure that we, we need uh, frontal fractures and mental fracture or, or any yeah. of those? Because the task requires it, but what the task taps into might be something which doesn't require it. So if in order to understand an affordance, who I have to grab a knob, that might require mental imagery, but that doesn't require understanding contrafactual or time travel, and that task is a difficult task which, um, which requires uh, contrafactual, but that task is only taps into a capacity to grab things and can, can know I, to grab it. So can, can I make an unfriendly version of your question? Sure. Because your, your, your version was really friendly. So here's the unfriendly version of okay. this question. Uh, kids can act intentionally, kids can perform ordinary bodily action, they, they can do affordance judgments of some sort, maybe it's less good and so on, there's m more noise. Uh, they can't do voluntary motor imagery. So um, is my argument problematic? So um, if you look at kids then I can't do my argument. Uh, what impact does it have on the argument in adults? Uh, so far no impact. Um, but it does tell you something about the capacities and the way you can learn. But um, what the, the case of kids shows is that there are, um, um, I mean, I would have to say something about the connection between implicit motor imagery and voluntary motor imagery processes such that kids can actually perform these computations but um, somehow they, they can't report them in the correct way or the, the computation gets defaulted somewhere along the way. So it would be the, like the type of explanations that people give in the mind reading literature for why, for example, the looking time data about uh, representations for false belief are correct very early on based on one set of tasks, but uh, the explicit uh, performance of those tasks only comes at age four. So, so, the, the nativist. so you would want to actually draw mental imagery into the reason, so what I'm, because what I'm wondering, it seemed like it, it sort of a, it needs to be there in order for you to make the co make comment you made about proprioception and the function it plays. And I mean, that seems like it could be a solution. You could say, fine, they don't display this stuff at age four. Let's draw it into infancy in some innate way such that they just can't show it until age four would be the mind reading people. Uh, yeah, that's what they do, but I don't yeah. need to do it in, in, in that very strong way. So It doesn't actually matter for you. Well... What, so that, that would be one response that I, I could, could give. Sure. Uh, that would be one response. Another response would be that, um, that they're still basically... So I think if I were Philip Usha answering on my behalf, I would give this response. Basically, they are, ba they are tuning all the sensory motor contingencies and the uh, intentions are unfairly effective at that point and there's lots of stuff. So they're basically still tuning all the response curves such that uh, the connection between proprioception and motor imagery isn't that tight yet. So for example, a prediction of that account would be that the affordance judgments aren't so good. That they're what, sorry? The affordance judgments aren't so good. In terms of, affordance judgments would be like the... Grabbing yeah, stuff, whether things are grabbable and so on and so forth. And that okay. would support that account. And uh, then that account would leave open what would be the future connection between proprioception and that. And uh, further, another connection would be if certain children lose certain capacities, the tuning curves become very different, which is something that has been shown. Okay. How, how good are these infants at planning? Does that come around the same time, or are they good at planning before this? Depends what you mean by planning. The means ends yeah. planning, so just the basic capability yeah. is probably about a 10 month thing. Okay. Okay. Uh, but then there's an egocentrism to it that progressively disappears, so uh, I might be a I don't know, 18 month old who knows I need to, uh, I don't know, get the blanket before I can cover the doll, but I'm sitting on it, I don't realize I need to move first. So they're pretty stupid. Well, it's very egocentric, in a <laughs> yeah, sense. Okay. Um, and so it depends what you mean by planning. Okay. And of course, I mean, there's going to be the different uh, 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 distinctions. Give the chairs. Okay, this is very nice. Okay. So I'll be very quick. Because um, I was, this is a sort of follow-up. Because I was thinking, you know this, you know the sort of work by um, Chizek on the affordance competition mm -hmm. hypothesis, and I was a bit skeptical of right at the beginning the, the sort of argument that 
a sort of choice between actions in some sense involves um, a sense of practical possibilities and implicit knowledge of one the practical possibilities. And I think, especially in evolutionary terms, and, and maybe in developmental terms, you might think we start off with something like this affordance competition hypothesis, mm -hmm. and only later do we develop <laughs> a capacity for real, maybe, where we, where we have a representation of the goal prior to the beginning of the action. Mm -hmm. And so, so this, this, this sort of story says you've got... But in the affordance competition hypothesis, hypothesis, you do have the representation of the goal. It's just that you have multiple representations of multiple goals. Well, but I take it the representations are something like, they're all like potential actions. Yeah, 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 so they're right. like these impulses mm -hmm. that are competing with each other, mm -hmm. but they're impulses that each one has a sort of goal it's striving mm -hmm. towards maybe, so they're goal-directed impulses. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't take it the So you have a representation of all these potential actions. Mm -hmm. but I don't think that do we really have a sense of practical possibilities, or does this entail an implicit knowledge of the practical possibilities? Cause, cause so, uh, you've, got the, you've got the representations of all the possible motor actions, mm -hmm. yeah? Um, but it's not clear whether to cash that out in terms of a implicit knowledge. So I take it that the Chisak thing yeah. supports my picture, actually. So if you, if you look at the behavioral repertoire that would be, that you would find in the uh, competing, the competing mm -hmm. motor activations, there will all be activations of of things within your motor repertoire. It wouldn't be things not from your motor repertoire. So it's it's very consistent with what I'm saying. Okay. I don't want to push it. We're at. I don't want. The first countdown. I was drawing attention to her comment. Okay. Yeah. No, so it's just um, for the developmental one. So, yeah, I mean, normally we have proprioceptive information, and we can also can have conscious proprioceptive awareness. Maybe not, but you were saying that actually from the beginning that proprioceptive information is pervasive, whereas the proprioceptive awareness, awareness need not be. Yeah. So I was wondering, they might be coming also in developmental stages. So you might think that proprioceptive information is there all along. But the purpose of mm -hmm. consciousness might be um, developed at a later stage, and you might think that that in that case, proprioceptive awareness might be required for, let's say, mental imagery. But in the very basic motor, um, implicit motor uh, imagery, you might think that proprioceptive information is enough. So I'm just saying you can take on both the developmental <coughs> stuff as well, like information without consciousness enough for basic motor imagery but I mean if the task is very hard mm -hmm. then the motor imagery thinking that they can have motor imagery for hard task without actually ability to have voluntary motor imagery start to look spooky you might realize that it can only happen at the state developmental stage when not only we have perceptive information but also conscious awareness I don't know, I'm just that's speculating that's, that those two yeah. things we have now might be coming in stages in developmentally as well. I don't know anything about developmental structure, but because we have a psychologist, I thought we can ask whether it can also come in stages. I don't know. That makes sense? Uh, the main purpose of the sense not that I have any expertise on proprioception and motor <laughs> development and all the rest of it. But it makes very good sense, yeah, I, I think. Um, then we can also maybe take into account that it would accommodate, yeah, accommodate the problem. It, right. um, it wouldn't accommodate the um, so a, a lot of the explicit tasks, for example, like in mind reading or, or in imagery, you require sort of development of more prefrontal structures which are simply not present, and uh, that's another factor. Another batch of research that I think goes in the same direction is Gerald Edelman's work mm -hmm. on you know, neuronal development mm -hmm. and the way in which um, neuronal connections that are found to be effective get reinforced in early development. And this is also part of the development of visual systems, which even in human beings in part develop to accommodate the surroundings, right? The, the Miller Lauer, oh, sorry, Miller Lauer illusion um, is 
hardly experienced or not at all experienced by cultures that don't build rectilinear buildings. Mm -hmm. And that really is, you know, quite fundamental in the development. In this case, it's about size constancy recognition yes. within the perceptual system, the visual system. So, I mean, there certainly are ways in which this might well happen in developmental stages. <clears throat> And, I and it's information, it's information processing and exploitation that, you know, you want to call that a structure, okay, but, you know, a representational structure is a big stretch. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's a criticism. I just think that's another marker that when we're talking about a representational structure, it's a placeholder. I know, definitely. <laughs> I agree. Um, Lucas, do you want to come back and no, address I, on the, the point? We can talk at dinner about affordances. And let's okay. thank our speakers. Thank you. Thank you. We've, got, we've got one more session. Um, we'll have a five minute.